Welcome to the Good Karma Sport Fishing Podcast. I'm your host, Captain Ryan Van Fleet. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. It's uh, Tuesday morning, August 18th. I had a last minute cancellation, so I'm home today, which is okay because I have a ton of stuff I'm working on and I need to get completed here. I've got kind of some deadlines on a few things, so... I also manage uh, another boat. Another. I also. You guys know that I that I manage a C one hundred thirty nine for a private client, and I then I have my boat. It goes back to like, I'm very happy that I don't run multiple boats because <laughs> to having two boats is a lot of work. But um, that's for a po- I'm going to share some stuff about that here in a future podcast. I'm going to be doing that with Melinda, and we're going to talk about the multiple boat operation and. And why I don't do it. So I have enough business to run multiple boats, but I I don't. And there's many reasons why. So I'll, but I'll go into that here in the future. So I got a couple things I want to cover today. And then, like I said, I've got a busy day, so I, the podcast has to be short. Now, first, I want to talk about the app. And I want to thank you guys for downloading the app. Now we're in phase one of the app, the Good Karma Sport Fishing app. So we're working out a few things with Apple. Apple is a pickle to work with. And a pickle, I'm using pickle because I can use some swear words. <laughs> so, But they're extremely challenging. But um, a couple things with the app. If you're using an Apple phone, then guys are telling me they're getting a blank screen with the colors. Guys, it takes a couple seconds for the app to load. So I'm using an iPad and it loads just fine for me, and I'm using an Android, and it loads just fine. But like with anything, uh, things take time, and I'm very happy with the way that the um, the app launched. But before I move into phase two with other stuff, <laughs> I'm very excited about the other stuff, actually, because I'm developing this app for you guys, and I'm, I'm super excited about it. Let's just put it like that. There's going to be a lot of good stuff on there. You're not going to, I mean, you're just going to want to, like, when you're sitting at, at your desk or you have some time, you're going to want to like scroll through the app once I'm all done with this, especially when I get into phase two and in the, in the phase three, you start getting into some really good stuff. So, but that's a hundred percent confidential right now because the ideas are very original and we're, you guys are going to love them. Okay. So I had a uh, trip on Saturday with, um, uh, I got a call from, Jose, and he booked me like a couple months ago, I forget when it was, but anyway, so uh, we had a, a trip booked for Saturday, and he wanted to take his nine-year-old grandson fishing with his dad, and I love taking kids fishing, man. I just think that it just brings me back to when I was a kid. I know how much joy they get out of going fishing, and, and when I saw the youngster, <laughs> he was like... He was just so happy to be out on the water. And it just brings back memories from when I was nine, when the the kid was nine years old. And he's just just like a super cool kid. I called him Little Ninja, Um, Banana Skin Ninja, because he's a big old, big old Fortnite player. And I guess there's all those skins in Fortnite. I don't know a damn thing about Fortnite. So, but I know that's what the kids play. So I kept giving him our time about what, um, what skin he was and all that stuff. But, but um, he just reminded me of myself when I was nine my dad and my grandfather would take me fishing as much as they could. They both worked in the trades and the plumbing and heating industry. And they worked very long hours, very long hours. And I would always want to go fishing. And because I, I, I would like go by myself whenever I could to the ponds on my bike. And I'd fish in ditches and all the sorts of rivers and muddy stuff just to go fishing. And I would fish in flooded out waters in the neighborhood for catfish and like all these different overflow ponds and for largemouth bass and stuff when my, when my dad and my grandfather couldn't um, take me because they were working. So the, um, so when we did go, I was extremely excited and sometimes that things didn't go the way I wanted them to go. I was very impatient. I thought that we should be catching more fish. I thought we should be moving spots. That especially was true with duck hunting. I was extremely impatient, extremely impatient. And my dad would always tell me, he said, you just got to wait it out. It's going to happen. It's not probably not going to happen until late if it didn't happen. But I was like never believing him. And nine times out of ten, he was always right. 
And we either got them or we didn't at the end of the day. So we had our shots, and if I missed, it was on me. And I would kick myself in the butt because I'm like, man, he was right. So over time, I learned that. And it took a while because I was very, very impatient. And I still talk to my dad. My my dad is like, okay, so I'll talk to him about a trip. And I had to, if I had some wild kids or if I had a client that was extremely impatient with me with the fishing, and he goes, Ryan, those clients were are were just like you. They were new to their they're new kind of new to fishing. They haven't had a lot of experience with patience and fishing. So it's taken so you have to remember it's taken years to develop patience and fishing. So I have to like as a guide, I have to keep that in back of my head. Now I had a hard time with that when I first started about an individual being impatient. And I've just had to take a step back and say, you were like that, Ryan. You were like that. So, which gets me back to any time you're fishing, it's all good. And whether you get them or not. And I try to explain to people that, you know, it's going to happen. And, and you just have to be patient. If we don't get them, you're going to get your shots, just like my dad taught me. And, and I see a lot of new fishermen out there buying boats and trying to get into fishing late in life. And one thing I have to tell people has, has you're learning how to fish and your patient level, your patience level may not be there, but in order to be better, you need to learn how to like manage that a little bit better to know that things are going to happen, might happen later. So you got to stick it out and you might get your shot and you might not, but you're going to learn a little bit more. So just keep that in mind, guys, you know, especially if you're starting out late, just buying a new boat is that patience it's like fishing. You have to learn how to manage it, okay? You have to learn how to manage it. And you might get really impatient. You might want to quit. You might want to move and da 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 And I hear this all the time in my Facebook group now. It's like, man, I think we're kind of – some people are just getting off track about it, about the whole, like, big picture about it. And it's not always catching the biggest fish is what my dad taught me. It's not always about, like – killing the most ducks for pictures. God, we didn't even have pictures on Instagram back then. And I didn't even like, once in a while, I would take fish pictures to school. And the kids that I went to school with were like, didn't give a shit about it. And I think that's where I'm at with this stuff today is like, I grew up in an era where it didn't really matter about fish pictures and, or showing off the biggest fish. It was about taking some pride in what you caught and like looking at your own pictures and saying, man, what a great day, you know? And like, talking about it with your family members and your friends and you're trying to get a buddy to go fishing. So I just feel that that's kind of getting like lost out there. So, which brings me back to my trip on Saturday. So I had Jose, the grandfather booked me and he brought his son and his youngest son, which was nine. And we had a good day of fishing. I mean, yeah, we caught like, you know, um, Jose said on the way out, he wanted to catch a black grouper. And I was like, yeah, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of hot. But I was like, I haven't fished for black grouper in a while. And I said, oh, you might as well give it a shot. You never know. I like, so we went and fished for black grouper and, and he got a black grouper right away. So, and then we caught some nice big mangrove snappers and some yellowtail. And it was, a, it was just a great day, but I didn't feel like the, the nine-year-old, I call him Ninja because he's like, he's a look like a little ninja, man. He was really quick and he's really patient. And I was like, man, I wish I had your patience when I was a kid. And he was kind of feeling a little sick. And I, I don't like, I feel, I feel really guilty when a little boy's getting sick. And I try to do my best to get him more involved because what happened was we had a big current rip that set in and the sea keeper does a really good job of eliminating side to side seasickness, but you have an up and down movement. Okay. So the boat goes up and down. I call that car sick, um, seasickness. So that's where most kids and adults get sick is the, uh, the up and down movement of the, I call it the hill movement up and down hills. Like you're riding in the back seat of a cab in a foreign country with no air conditioning. That's kind of how it feels that seasickness. So he was when that rip set in and the current shut off the boat started doing all sorts of stuff and the sea keeper was working really hard and the rip was taking us up and down on anchor and it really puts a strain on your body especially if you're not used to it so he got a little sick and man i felt like 
we could have caught all those fish, but I just wanted that kid to have fun. That's all I wanted. That's all that mattered to me. That's all that mattered. So we had a, so the, what happened was first we caught a bull shark. And it was a really big bull shark. And I typically don't mess with sharks, but they wanted to fight him up. And I was like, yeah, it's shark week. Let's just bring him up and take a picture of the bull shark. And the bull shark left. He left us, which was awesome. And then we started catching some really nice yellowtail snappers, which was a real treat. And they're really large, which was awesome. And then we had a, a hammerhead swim up to us. And I had a bonito carcass. And I asked the boy, I was like, you want to feed the shark? And the boy's like, oh, my God, I've never seen that kid move so fast. It's like his seasickness went away. He had this big smile. And my heart just lifted. Guys, we had a cooler full of fish. I could give a shit less about that. I really could care less. Because all I wanted at that point was for that kid to have fun and put a smile on his face. I mean, he was doing really good at first catching some yellowtails, and he got sick, and I was like, oh, man. But that shark came by, and I said, hey, take a look at this. And he got up so quick, went to the back of the boat with me, and we threw out that carcass, and that hammerhead ate that shark. He came up to the back of the boat. I got him on video for him to see, and he looked at me at a big smile, and he was so happy to see that. It was shark week, and he had a story to tell his friends now. And he has to go back to school, which is, and, and all this coronavirus has been really tough on the kids. I mean, I think people are forgetting about that. It's tough on the kids. And just to see that kid smile was amazing. So, but, you know, it's like I had some awesome comments from people saying, you know, you know that because I have a lot of friends that live up north and they don't get to see that kind of stuff either. And because they're in quarantine up there, too, that people are not moving around and doing a lot. You know, they are either outside or they're inside. They're not there's no social interaction right now. So and things kind of hit me personally with my family this past week, but I'm not going to get into that. So but there's a lot of people up there that are stuck in the houses still and people that are scared. So, you know, I. I posted the video on Facebook for my friends only and my family members to see because they don't get to see that kind of stuff. And it's cool when you see something that's not staged. And the fish swam up. He was a really big fish and saw him eat the, eat the um, bonito carcass. And then the, the hammerhead swam off. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but once you feed a shark like that, he leaves and just cruises. Typically, hammerheads, they just migrate through. And they're, that fish was migrating and you could just tell he was—he just was. He didn't want anything to do with anything, and he just was out of there. So I see that a lot in the areas that I fish, from Conk down to Pickles down to Molasses Reef. Um, the hammerheads that I do see that they're always on the move. And when you're out there every day, you learn the habits of these sharks and when they're going to be there and when not to fish certain areas, and you'll learn their migration habits. If you're not um, figuring that out, you're not out there enough. So, and then you know when to be there, you know when to not, you know when the water sharky, you know when to leave. It's just how it goes when it goes with reef fishing. Sharks' habits are easily predictable, if you, but you got to fish every day to figure it out. And you got to have a logbook. Now, I'm going to help you guys do the fishing reports on the app, which are going to give you guys a step ahead to say, hey, are there, is there shark problems, what's happening, and all that good stuff. So, it was super cool to see some, first I want to thank all the guys that, it, should, it made some awesome comments. So, <laughs> but there's always that someone out there that's going to make a snarky comment. And that's just part of being in this space, guys. But it always brings me back to why I do this. My motto is anytime you're fishing, it's all good. And making that kid smile brings me back to why I do this. And it's not about me at all out there or catching the biggest fish. It's about the client. And when I have kids, I want them to have fun. That's it. I want them to have fun. And I want to provide the absolute best family fishing trip I can provide. And that's catching good eating fish, lots of fun, and then seeing some something cool. Because kids like to see something cool and they want to have a great story. And I want to thank the guys that showed their support 
and through the Facebook group and through my Instagram, through the direct messages. So like I said, there's always going to be that snarky guy. It's just part of the space I'm in. And two, funny, I get a lot of updates from people all over South Florida, actually. And I get a lot of updates through email, um, direct messages from people that are part of the group and have been listening to the podcast for years that are involved in certain areas of fishing. And I had uh, the, the updates I'm getting lately are guys warning me about the pirate groups of GPS guys that are out there to gang up on me out there and <laughs> steal my spot, steal the spots I'm fishing. No, I don't own the ocean, but you guys know what I'm talking about. They're, they're the guys that have been setting on me. And, but guys, all that stuff is not going to make you a great fisherman. Okay. So you can steal all the spots. You can pirate me all you want. You can set on me, but you know what? It just makes you look like an asshole, okay? And that goes to every other guy out there that has worked their ass off, figured out patterns, and then you got you guys are, are – and then I'm getting updates from guys that are really good fishermen telling me that they're on the list too for these pirate groups out there. Guys, um, it's kind of, I'm going to refer this to an example here. It's kind of a, like a jockey. It's like jockeys are just, they, uh, a good jockey. I know a really good jockey that's retired, and he's actually the dock master at Tavernier Creek Marina, and he's extremely good with animals, like amazing. And what it comes down to is how that jockey is with the horse, okay? So, Basically, you can take a guy like you could like go buy a a guy's prized horse that's won a ton of races, and then you could take him and race him in the same condition, and you'll probably lose. It's it's really about the jockey and the horse, okay? Not about just the horse. So, guys, I do everything I can through this podcast to help people out, and I've been getting some amazing emails from people and comments through Instagram. Like I'm having record, having a record year was the latest one I've gotten, which I think that's so awesome. It makes me feel really good. Um, the emails I got over the past couple of weeks have been awesome with people sharing the stories about the courses that they've been buying that have been helping them. It's those little things that are making the difference for people. So through the podcast and through the courses, I will continue putting great stuff out there for you guys. I work really hard at doing it. I spend a lot of time on this stuff. So I just ask if you're going to direct message me through, through Instagram. I don't check that stuff much anymore. But I, I have to because I get some once in a while. I get a, somebody looking for a charter. So if you're going to direct message me, please keep your, keep your comments kind. And that's where I'm going to, that's where I'm going to leave it today. Guys, I'm putting out a new fishing report in the app here this morning. So you're going to have to listen to the fishing report through the app or you can get it through the Facebook group. Guys, I got to wrap this up because I got a ton of things to do today. I got this project I absolutely have to get done this afternoon. So, and I've got to do the fishing report right after this and get it uploaded to the app for you guys. So you'll have a fishing report. So with the fishing reports, I'm trying to do two to three a week. I've got some updates for you guys, so let you guys know what's happening for the guys that want to try to swing down before the weather kicks up this weekend. It does look like the wind's going to pick up, but who knows? Mother Nature, I mean, it's Mother Nature. You never know, so don't count on it anymore. So if you've taken anything away from this podcast today and you're really working at trying to get better, first you need to learn patience. And patience is hard to learn. Believe me, it's taken many years to get to this point with myself. I do believe that more people, and rather when you're taking your kids fishing, is to try to really, really, really try to teach them patience. I don't know anything about teaching kids patience. I really don't because I don't have kids. So all I know is, is that when I'm on the water, I've got ways to try to like teach. And it's just a different way of trying to express how you should be patient. So, and it, just some tools that I share with people. 
So, but if you're new to fishing and you get impatient, just remember, and when you're looking at the Instagram and you're seeing all these guys catching all these fish, it's not about that, guys. Now, listen, <laughs> I got, you know what, I'm going to let you know a little secret here, okay? A lot of these cooler pictures that you're seeing with these, all these fish, guys, especially with multiple boat operations, you know, a lot of times they've thrown all the fish into one cooler from three boats. And when you're seeing guys posting 10 to 15 mutton snappers and they're guys, some of those fish are saved for like a day. Okay. And then they combine two days to make it look like they caught all those fish. So there's a lot of Instagram stuff out there that you guys need to be aware of. Don't think that some people are catching all these fish in one day because they're not. I know all the inside tricks because I like, I know I've been doing it a long time as far as knowing what guys do. I'm not going to, now, the dolphin fishing thing, you know, yeah, you're going to catch a lot of schoolies. Dolphin fishing's not that hard when there's a lot of, when you find the fish. And it's been challenging finding, you know, good packs of fish and lately for people. And and some guys catch them, the other guys don't. That's, I mean, honest to God, that's the way it's supposed to work. If everybody was catching them all the time, then there wouldn't be any fish left. <laughs> that's how it works. You want everybody to be successful out there and catch fish, but... There's always going to be somebody that doesn't catch them, and there's always going to be the guy that does. And one thing that I had, I'm going to leave you this one point. One thing that I was first taught is that there's always going to be a guy that catches a big fish, especially down here in the Keys. It's just the way it works. I mean, the Keys is a big area. There's fish moving through at certain times of the day. Sometimes they're in Marathon at point of day. Sometimes they're south. Sometimes they're not north. It's just how it works. Just how it works. That's all I got, guys. Make sure you check out my website, goodkarmasportfishing.com, my tackle store, goodkarmafishingtackle.com. Uh, check out the new courses. I'm going to be releasing several courses here over the next couple of weeks that I'm working on. Follow me on Instagram, goodkarmasportfishing, underscore FL, underscore keys. That's all I got. Oh, and download the Good Karma Sport Fishing app. You can find that in the iTunes store and in the Google Play store. That's it. And remember, anytime you're fishing, it's all good. Thanks, guys.